On the screen is an image of Ted Couser, the Nebraska poet and former U.S. Poet Laureate. This video will be about a musical setting of one of Couser's poems, but first, I want to start with his words. Here is the text to his poem, Perfectly Still, This Solstice Morning, from a book called Winter Morning Walks. I'll read the poem aloud, and as I do, I'd like you to focus on three aspects. Punctuation, the different consonants that appear in the poem, and the effect of both on the speed of my reading. Perfectly still this solstice morning, in bone-cracking cold, nothing moving, or so one might think. But as I walk the road, the wind, held in the heart of every tree, flows to the end of each twig and forms a bud. This is what stands out to me when I read the poem aloud. First, let's deal with punctuation. Lines 1 to 3 all have punctuation marks at their end, but there's an enjambment between lines 4 and 5. Also, there are caesuras in lines 2 and 3, the period in the middle of line 2 and the comma in the middle of line 3, but nowhere else. Couser's punctuation makes me read lines 1 to 3, and especially lines 2 to 3, more slowly than lines 4 to 5, which flow much more easily. I sense a gradual acceleration of declamation as I progress through the poem. The consonants add to this effect. The multiple S consonants in the first line slow the pace with which I read, and remarkably, there are five of them. Still, this, sols, tis. The percussive consonants in bone cracking cold also force me to read more slowly. The last three lines, however, include consonants that don't involve as much restriction of airflow. Note the W and R consonants in As I Walk the Road the Wind, as well as the alliterative H's in Held in the Heart, and the repeated F's in Flows to the End of Each Twig, and Forms. In short, rhythmically and also phonetically, the last three lines are the easiest to enunciate. They flow more freely than any other lines in the poem. The sounds of the poem are related to its meaning. The poetic rhythms and phonemes begin to flow as the wind does. But that interests me less than the way those sounds affect the sensations we experience when we read the poem aloud. In an email to me, Ted Kuser confirmed how important sound and the production of sound are to his writing process. To this day, he wrote, I can't read prose any faster than I could read it aloud. That gives me an advantage as a poet, it seems, since I am always aware of the sounds my words are making. I begin with this exercise in reciting poetry, because the focus of my video is how song composers respond not just to the meanings of words, but also to their sounds, and more to the point, to the sensations we experience when we produce those sounds. I want to explore how a particular performance of a song and a particular performance of a poem can heighten our awareness of the connections between music and the materiality of poetry. With that goal in mind, let us turn to a musical setting of Couser's poem by another Midwesterner, the Minnesota-born composer Maria Schneider, shown on the right in the slide. Perfectly Still This Solstice Morning is the first song in her 2013 song cycle, Winter Morning Walks, which includes settings of nine Couser poems from his collection of the same title. The cycle was written for the soprano Dawn Upshaw, shown on the left, the Australian Chamber Orchestra, and Schneider's Jazz Ensemble of bass, piano, and clarinet. A recording with these musicians was released in the same year, and the next year it won three Grammy Awards. This is the definitive performance of the work, and the one I'll use in this video. As luck would have it, there's a recording of Schneider reading the poem. It appears in a video in which she walks through her creative process in writing this song, available via subscription at the website artistshare.com. 
Her reading, which I'll play in a moment, is revealing, especially when it comes to the pace of declamation. Notice how she pauses at the end of every line, but more at the end of lines 1 and 2 than at the end of lines 3 and 4, and less at the end of line 4 than anywhere else where there is an enchantment. I show these pauses with different sized breath marks. Notice also where she pauses in the middle of lines, especially after still in line one, after cold in line two, and after think in line three, but not really in lines four and five. The cumulative effect is that in Schneider's reading, there's more rhythmic continuity at the end of the poem than at the beginning. Here is her reading. Perfectly still this solstice morning, in bone-cracking cold, nothing moving, or so one might think. But as I walk the road, the wind held in the heart of every tree flows to the end of each twig and forms a bud. How then does Schneider's music respond to the physical, material elements of the poem? Here's the first half of the song's vocal melody, which I've drawn from the official study score, also available at artistshare.com. Let me first describe a few of the melody's features and then play a recording. Notice that Schneider repeats either complete poetic lines or partial poetic lines up until or so one might think, which is not repeated. And incidentally, Upshaw sings this line or so I might think. Each time the text is repeated, it's accompanied by a repeated rhythm. These repetitions allow us to linger on the words in the first half of the poem, further slowing the delivery of the text. So does the space between the melodic gestures. Not only are there rests between lines of text, there are also rests within lines of text. There's even a rest within one word, solstice, which emphasizes the S sounds in this word. Finally, listen for how the pianist, improvising over the string's C drone, fills many of these rests with spare, astringent sonorities, containing sevenths and ninths. Here's the first half of the song. The second half of the song is freer and more fluid than the first half, which accords with the flow of the language itself and the very motion it describes, the flowing of a winter wind that arises from stillness and rustles the trees. This time I'll play the excerpt first and then point out some of its most striking musical features. I'll begin from Or So One Might Think.
What makes the music sound so free and fluid? First, there's no more text repetition from this point onward. Not surprisingly, there's also less rhythmic patterning. Second, there's much less separation between the melodic gestures, much shorter note values, and a greater extreme and register from high A down to low G. Third, the entrance of piano runs and accumulating strings, eclipsing the foregoing C drone, contributes to the sense of increased movement in this part of the song. To put it simply, the poetry starts to flow, and so does the music. Schneider, in an email to me, suggested as much. The second half of the poem, she wrote, has a rounder, more flowing sound than the first section, where the expression of the words is about cold, constriction, lack of motion. I tried to bring that to music, and then bring the flow to the part of the poetry that expresses movement, life force, and rebirth, all expressed with softer consonants. What about Upshaw's performance of Schneider's song? Upshaw underscores a number of details I've mentioned. For example, note how she emphasizes the S consonants in her singing of the words this solstice in measure two, and also how she handles the repetition of these words two measures later. Instead of completely separating them, she fills the eighth note rest with the S consonants. Here's the first phrase of the song once again. In the next measures, however, Upshaw does something a little unexpected. Rather than sharply attacking the plosive consonants of bone-cracking cold, which is what Schneider did in her reading, she softens them. She backs away from the percussive consonants and changes to a breathier tone, and she maintains this tone in the next words, nothing moving. Here is Schneider's reading of the line. In bone-cracking cold, nothing moving. And here is Upshaw's performance of it. The audible passage of breath in Upshaw's singing of these lines introduces a sound that resembles the S sound from the previous measures, an aspirated H. The breathiness of her tone, combined with the almost flute-like sound of the string's harmonics, gives the entire passage a subtle hissing sound. Upshaw's performance of the second half of the song likewise highlights some poetic features I've discussed and reveals some new features. Recall that I pointed out the gentle W and R consonants in As I Walk the Road the Wind. Upshaw lengthens the R of road, chewing the consonant rather than flipping it with the tip of the tongue. She also exaggerates the W of wind, not just by lengthening it, but by sliding into it. Here is what she might have done. But as I walk the road, the wind. And here's what she actually does. But as I walk the road, the wind. Even more intriguing, she does the same thing with consonants that I haven't discussed. 
I'm thinking of the R in tree and the L in flows, which she slides into like the W of wind. For all these reasons, I hear even more sonic fluidity in Upshaw's performance of the song than I do in Schneider's performance of the poem, or in my own. Here, as a final example, is her performance of the last half of the song one more time. The poet, Robert Pinsky, has arguably written more about the sounds of poetry than any other writer. In a book on reading and writing poetry, Pinsky says, Noticing the diverse vocal sounds of poetry does not diminish one's pleasure in the poem by picking it apart. On the contrary, fine-grained, technical understanding can heighten pleasure. The person who understands more about any kind of excellence with access to a fine, wide range of detail, has more to enjoy. Music theorists, musicologists, and lovers of song are wise to remember that the sonic patterns of poetry are no less fine-grained and no less affecting than those of music. And furthermore, that we can learn from performers of both song and poetry, since their performances shape what we do as music analysts more than we may realize. Performance of song and poetry is not just something that supports analysis, but something that demands analysis and deserves to play an important role in our continued explorations of song. <laughs>